Welcome to another live session for the online course, and the floor is open for your questions. Okay, the first question is, is it true that the planets in our solar system are all warmer in recent years? If so, would this be due to the sun or energy from the galaxy? Um, I'm not sure that the planets in the solar system are warming up in short terms, you know, less than geological time scales. Certainly nothing like uh, is happening to the Earth is happening to those planets. Um, so basically, no, the planets are not changing their temperatures on short time scales. On longer time scales, uh, they are because the sun is going to burn hotter as it gets older. So as the sun uses up its hydrogen, turns it into helium, it reconfigures and, and sort of burns a little hotter or fuses a little hotter in the center. So solar radiation is going to increase. Um, the sun was about 30% fainter than it is now uh, three or four billion years ago. And in fact, the Earth was barely on the edge of the habitable zone then. Um, so that long time scale change of the sun brightening up is going to continue. So in that sense, the planets will all get warmer as the solar radiation increases, but only on time scales of hundreds of millions or billion or so years. All right, the next question is, what is the possibility to live on another planet like Mars? And if so, what would we have to do to make it livable? And how would we send humans there? Um, okay, big questions, of course, and very much in the public eye uh, with the book and the movie The Martian, which I will refer to. I'm not going to assume everyone's read the book or seen the movie, though you should probably do both. The book has um, a lot of detail that the movie missed, although I like the movie too. Um, and it's basically all about that question of how we would live on Mars. Um, Mars is a pretty uninhabitable place. So just to put it in simple terms, because of the small size, one quarter, size and uh, significantly weaker gravity, Mars has not been able to hold an atmosphere over time, although it had a thicker atmosphere a few billion years ago. And because of its 50% larger distance from the sun, receives uh, half the solar radiation. That puts Mars on the edge of being a frigid desert. Um, basically, you know, water is below the freezing point at most places on Mars' surface. Um, the atmosphere is 1% of the density and pressure of the Earth's atmosphere, which is almost no atmosphere at all. And life as we know it could not survive on the surface of Mars because of the solar radiation and cosmic rays essentially sterilize the top inch or so of the Martian soil. So living on Mars essentially means creating a complete habitat. And most of the estimations of our ability to live on Mars depend um, because of the huge cost of getting supplies 50 million miles. That's the direct route would be 50 million miles. In practice, given the orbits, you're actually traveling several hundred million miles in a spacecraft to get to Mars. And the time, the minimum time for a manned mission is eight or nine months. So given the enormous expense of getting to Mars, uh, most viable plans for living on Mars, even for short periods of time, a few months, uh, involve generating things that you need on Mars itself. So in the book and movie of the Martian, a lot of the plot and most of the movie in the first half was based on the ability of Nick Watney, the astronaut, to grow his own food in the Martian soil by essentially boosting its capability so that, uh, and of course being in a bubble dome where you had um, breathable air, so that you could grow crops on Martian soil. And so we'd have to do that too. Uh, the cost of bringing food, even freeze-dried food, is prohibitive. Um, so you'd have to figure out a way to grow food on Mars. And the and the book and the the book especially is a nice little readable summary of what it would take to grow food on Mars, even for a handful of people. The other two things you'd need on Mars to live there are uh, water and oxygen. Um, Water exists on Mars in the deep below the surface, so the place you would choose to live would be a place where there's subsurface water, probably in aquifers. Perhaps, literally, you could just dig a well and get water. More likely, you'll be using machines that NASA's tested where you extract water from the soil, uh, water sort of built, into the, built chemically into the rock materials and released through heat. It's not a very complicated process. It does involve substantial temperatures of seven or 800 degrees C. But we prototype that technology. And essentially, a cubic meter of Martian soil with that kind of heat release technology can liberate a liter of water. It's not that much. 
So you'd be working through tons of Martian soil to get the water you needed to drink. Of course, if you've got the water the, through electrolytic process or other process, you can generate oxygen that you would need to breathe. That oxygen also could be used to make rocket fuel. So those are the core ingredients you need to live. And the other, of course, is your habitat. So beyond the bubble dome itself, because of this cosmic ray flux, it's a hazardous radiation environment. So the other thing you would do, it wasn't actually represented in the movie or the book very well, certainly not the movie, which basically just showed a sort of bubble habitat. Um, you would actually have to turn that into a pretty hardened building. So another technology that exists is the ability to take Martian soil and again, through heat and chemical processes, turn it into essentially slump block. So you could generate building materials from the Martian soil and your bubble dome would then be covered and sealed in uh, this dense uh, melted Martian rock, which would shield you from cosmic rays. So these are all the ingredients you need to live on Mars. And that is not easy to do, but actually there are no amazing technologies and no laws of physics have to be broken. So we could do all of those things. Next question is from David, who is on with us live. He asks about the quantization of time and space. Is or could be time be is or could be could time be quantized? What is the current thinking? Um, right, it's a good question. It's about the core of physics, and um, and the the simple answer is we don't know because the theory we are missing is the theory that unites general relativity with quantum physics. So general theory is our theory of space and time. And in general relativity, there is no quantization of space and time. Um, however, there is the ability for space time to be curved, and space and time are interlinked in complicated ways, depending on local gravity. So that's our pretty robust theory of general relativity. And then we have the quantum theory that applies on the small scale and does indeed show that energy is quantized in the form of photons. And um, matter is, of course, quantized as subatomic fundamental particles. So we don't know the answer to the question because no successful theory has united the grainy, quantized, microscopic world theory of quantum mechanics with the smooth, curved space-time theory of general relativity. So having said that, what is the speculation? Well, the speculation is that at the finest possible grain of nature, both time and space indeed may be quantized. The quantization of space would not be a surprise given the quantization of mass energy in the form of particles. So that would not necessarily be a surprise. That's just an extension of current physics in a sense to a smaller scale. Quantization of time would be interesting and what would that actually mean? Um, first of all, the quantization of time, if it, ex if it exists, is operating at an incredibly small scale of time, uh, and so therefore would be imperceptible in the everyday world. So there have been physics experiments that try and attract the flow of time uh, through physical interactions and would be sensitive to quantization of time if it occurred on like a microsecond or nanosecond scale. And there's no hint of that. But in string theory and in other advanced series that try and unite quantum gravity, uh, make a theory of quantum gravity, time is actually quantized. Not all of them, however. So it's pretty much the frontier of physical theory to imagine if time is quantized. Simple answer at the moment, we don't know because we don't have a successful theory. All right, the next question is, um, so, oh, uh, recently I read a book on the multiverse by Max Tegmark. He talks about four levels of multiverses. Parallel universes are one way of explaining Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and avoiding the controversial Copenhagen interpretation. Is there any evidence? Um, no, not really. Um, I know the book you're, re you're referring to. I haven't read it. I've read uh, articles, technical articles, in fact, or and some popular articles by Max Tegmark. He's, he's a smart guy. He's, um, I've known him you know, casually for a while. Um, and he is what we would call a Platonist. He, his uh, philosophy, his natural philosophy, if you like, beyond his physics, which is his core training, is that uh, that goes back to the Plato thinking. Plato and Aristotle duked it out as the major philosophers of the ancient Greek period. And Plato believed that there were underlying realities in nature that we were dimly aware of through our imperfect sensory apparatus and that those, those realities might be mathematical. 
And this is also a theory that Pythagoras held too. So we're going back to the heart of philosophy from the ancient Greeks. The modern view of Platonism pretty much occurs with string theory, which refers to the underlying nature of reality as being mathematical, truly mathematical. In what Tegmark says in the higher levels of his multi-level universe, is that the underlying reality of nature is not particles and waves and energy and matter. It's mathematics alone, and that mathematics has ontological status um, as the substrate of reality. That's a pretty extreme position, and definitely not held by even a majority of, I'd say, his colleagues in the profession. Um, but it's defensible at some level, because mathematics has done such a good job of explaining the natural world. So to get back to your question, uh, the parallel universe concept does indeed emerge from the higher levels of this multi-level reality, where, to go back to the origin, the origin of the, multi the parallel universe idea, um, which date back 60 years, actually 70 years, um, when quantum probabilities uh, diverge, in other words, when nature takes one form of a quantum probability rather than another, both of those probabilities continue to exist, and basically nature spawns off a parallel universe. So when a particle ends up in a spin up or a spin down state, in this theory that Max is alluding to, there is a there is a universe where the particle ends up in the spin down state because that's what we measured. But there's a parallel universe where it mm -hmm. goes to the spin half up state, which is the other possible outcome in quantum theory. And so you have this proliferating set of realities based on quantum probabilities where each probability plays out as a separate universe. And you can see this gets pretty Byzantine. This sort of ends up as a, a, a multiplex of enormous consequence where the number of parallel universes is essentially starting to become infinite as the probabilities multiply. Now, skeptics, and it's legitimate to be a skeptic, of course, because this is metaphysics rather than science, would say, well, how can we possibly test this? And at the moment, there is no possible test of this idea. So but doesn't stop Max having a lot of fun with it. And as a Platonist, he's not worried about the fact that he's subverted reality by saying everything is just mathematics, just deal with it. Um, but the truth is, for it to become more than just a clever idea, it's going to have to make predictions that could be tested. OK, the next question is also from someone who is online with us, from Irene. Um, and she's interested in the twin paradox. If one twin leaves the Earth in a spaceship traveling close to the speed of light and then returns back to Earth, will that twin actually have aged less than the twin left behind on Earth? Meaning, is, it, is the age difference measurable? Hi, Irene. Um, yeah, it's a classic conundrum in physics and in astronomy and relativity. Um, it's not testable right now, but it would be a great thing to test. So the, the premise, of course, is that at close to light speed travel, time dilates. And so travels, uh, uh, time and clocks appear to run slower for the fast moving object relative to the stationary object. And so if, if someone was sent out at, it would have to be a significant fraction of the speed of light, half speed of light or more, which is unattainable for sending people in any time soon, probably for the next century or so. But to that person, uh, their clock would travel would move slower relative to the people left behind on the Earth. Um, and then they would come back home, perhaps at some future time, and the same thing would happen. They once again would be traveling relativistically, and their clocks would run slower. And so these effects would accumulate on the outward trip and the return trip. Now, for a while, people wondered whether the escape clause on this um, idea was the fact that there had to be a deceleration and then an acceleration when you turned around and started to come back home. Um, but it seems like if you go through the relativity calculations, the twin paradox is real, that the twin that travels at high speed to a distant location and then comes back home at high speed would indeed have aged less than the twin left behind. Um, how, what, how fast would it have to be to even be a measurable effect? Let's, let's forget about the extreme effect. Um, Something like 5%, a few percent of the speed of light, it would be an easily measurable effect, but not dramatic. And that is an interesting number because we do have technologies that could potentially send humans to a few percent of the speed of light. I mean, not anytime soon, but certainly within 30, 40, maybe 50 years. And in that case, we'd be sending someone out for a couple of years 
and when they came back, they would have aged uh, perhaps a few weeks less than the twin left behind. And, and that could be detected with metabolic tests and, um, and, potent, and obviously with the clocks that were traveling and then were left behind. That's not quite as exciting as the original twin paradox, but it's something that might actually be testable. All right, David, who is on with us live, um, is interested in black holes and asks, what is the current thinking on the size and density of the singularity at the center of a black hole? Do these properties depend on the mass, or does it always have infinite density and infinitesimal size? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and the simple answer is that black hole theory is known to be incomplete um, because black hole theory does indeed pres uh, predict a cusp, a density cusp in the center, which is an infinity of mass. And that is a feature of black holes of any size, rotating or not. So um, there's no real avoiding this. Um, the physical region that's better understood in the theory, of course, is the event horizon, which marks the boundary of space and time for communication with the outside world. That's like an information membrane rather than a physical barrier. But the singularity appears in all the calculations in general relativity, and it's why um, Stephen Hawking's quote on this was that general relativity contains the seeds of its own demise. He was, uh, he was referring to applying general relativity to black holes, where it essentially shows that it's incomplete by talking about an infinite cusp. Now, infinities are not quite as disturbing in physics as they should be to physicists or as they could be to people in other realms. High-energy physicists have been dealing with infinities for a long time. Uh, remember that in the standard model of particle physics, an extremely successful theory of nature, uh, the electron is a, is a point mass. It clearly has a mass, uh, but it's an unresolved uh, object of no dimension. And that means it's got infinite charge density and infinite mass density. So physics has been dealing with infinities uh, for decades with a, no a problem. They're finessed through calculations that still allow you to use quantum theory to do calculations. Uh, gravity theorists are dealing with the same situation, and they equally have finessed their way around the cusp the, at the center of the singularity, but it means we don't have a deeper understanding of what goes on inside a black hole. Okay, uh, the next question is from Paul, who again is on with us live, and Paul asks, what is the news on the discovery of an Earth-like planet found only four light years away uh, around Alpha Centauri B? Yeah, this is still up in the air. Um, the first claim of a Earth-like planet in the, essentially the nearest stellar system, very exciting if confirmed, mm -hmm. is a couple of years old now. Um, it's a very difficult observation, uh, even though the star is nearby. It just detecting Earth mass planets, uh, you have to we would have to have very lucky uh, geometry for this to be a transiting planet. And in fact, this isn't a transiting planet. So recognize that this claimed planet is being found by the Doppler method. And for the Doppler method, uh, Kepler is able to find or has been able to find Earth mass planets or Earth sized planets through transits quite easily. But the Doppler method, looking at Earth mass is extremely difficult, basically at the limit of the technology. So that's why this result has not been confirmed yet. It's because with the Doppler method, Earth mass is almost beyond reach. So you've got to pile up an awful lot of data. There are a couple of groups working on this because it's pretty important, obviously. Um, and they don't agree with each other yet. So when you see a claim for the planet, you're looking at the results from one group. The other group have not refuted that claim. They just say the data is inconclusive and they're not, and so they're sort of pouring a little cold water on these claims. This is going to resolve itself probably within a year. You just have to pile up a lot, you know, the orbit repeats, that's the good news, as you can beat down the noise just by uh, averaging, you know, months and months or years and years of data. And most people think it'll take three or four total years of data to resolve this issue. So we're about a year away. Um, so Paul also has a question about becoming a telescope operator um, once uh, once the he finishes his bachelor's degree at a school of mines. How would one look for work as a telescope operator? Um, does somebody need coursework or apprenticeships? Um, how does that happen? 
That's a good question. I, I mean, I know a lot of telescope operators, and some of them have been our former students, in fact. And so, you know, having a bachelor's in a technical subject, physics or astronomy or related field, is a definitely a good pathway in, and you don't always need an advanced degree. Um, so that is the basic path in. Telescope operators, um, you know, have, have actually quite a diverse skill set because they clearly need to know something about astronomy, the work that's being done at the telescope. But they also need to know quite a lot about computers. They need to know about control systems. Uh, they need to know about electronics, uh, cryogenics, probably, because they'll, they'll be dealing with cryogenics on many of the instruments. Now, they don't have to have like a deep, high level engineering knowledge of any of these things, but they end up having to know a lot about a lot of different things which is great. The job is certainly varied. I mean, if you can handle the nights and the schedule is usually four days on, four days off, something like that. So there's there's plenty of time off. Um, it's a pretty interesting work because you get to meet a lot of people, astronomers, of course, for the most part, but at all levels, students, professors, researchers. Uh, you get to see a lot of good instrumentation, sometimes visiting the telescope, not just the one instruments that live there. Um, my, my practical suggestion for how you get a, find a job like this is because they don't always tend to be advertised. They might be advertised through the university that hosts the telescope, such as through the University of Arizona, if it's one of our telescopes. But that's pretty hard to find in a web search, say, uh, given how many different universities have telescopes. Actually, not a huge number. The better one is to pick the observatories, the major observatories that have telescopes. Uh, small telescopes, medium size and large ones. So Mauna Kea, Kitt Peak, uh, the Arizona observatories, the Caltech observatories, the, the Lake Observatory, McDonald, etc. There's a not huge number in the U.S. and they will have their own web pages. And there's probably a person like a mountain superintendent um, or someone who runs the operations on the mountaintop. And and if you can just find their emails, it's not a huge number of people then contacting them directly is really the best way to get the lay of the land because they'll be able to say like how many telescope operators they employ and how often those jobs change hands and where they get advertised. So you sort of have to get to the source of the information, which means dealing with the sort of high level mountain superintendent or mountain operation manager. Um, and they will know everything. They'll be able to, answer, able to answer a lot of questions that like an HR person at a university would not be able to answer. My sense is that these jobs, um, not everyone is suited to be a telescope operator, but for the people who like it, they really like it. They like the flexibility, they like the work, they like being on beautiful mountaintops for the most part, even though they may deal with bad weather some part of the year. And so a lot of telescope operators I know have been doing their jobs for quite a while. They, they really like what they do. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't look. I mean, there's, there's clearly enough of a pool of people that there is turnover. All right, the next question is, how would our solar system be different if the sun were, say, half its mass or twice its mass? So hypothetically, uh, hypothetical other solar systems, um, you essentially just do the scaling with Kepler's laws. If, if the sun, you know, instantaneously lost half its mass through some magical process, it's uh, hard to imagine what that would be then obviously the orbits of the solar system would be disrupted. The planets essentially wouldn't be bound anymore, would spiral off into space. So a hypothetical solar system uh, with, a plant, with a star that was half the mass of the sun or twice the mass of the sun would be configured in a different way. However, all the orbits of the planets would still follow Kepler's laws for, uh, and Newton's law of gravity for that particular star. Um, so. Um, you know, the orbits would either shrink or grow depending on the mass of the star. Um, there are no particular situation for planets around a star. A planet can be at any position from a star as long as its orbital parameters obey Kepler's laws. All right. The next question is from someone from Gerald who is on with us live. Based on your writing and lecture, I am interpreting your material to say that a nova can only occur in a binary star system where one of the bodies is a white dwarf. Is that correct, or have I missed something? That's general, That's a supposition, um, because a nova is a pretty catastrophic event. It's a repeating event, but uh, not on a regular time scale, sort of irregularly repeating, sometimes on the time scale of a human life. There are well-known novae that 
go up every 10 years or 50 years or 70 years. And, and yes, the episodic flaring up of the companion star is caused by a material that feeds onto it from the companion, uh, causing thermonuclear reactions. And, you know, the, the gas that's coming from the companion compresses, heats up, fusion occurs, and that causes the star to brighten, which is how we see it as a nova. And then that subsides and that cycle will repeat. And not usually on a strictly periodic time scale, usually more episodic. So that's the supposition of what a nova is. There are extreme variable stars. There are Myra stars, Myra variables, and various variable stars that also have extreme luminosity fluctuations. But that's caused by more of a sort of uh, episodic uh, pulsation and thermostatic effect in the atmospheres of these pretty large and massive stars. So that's a different phenomenon. And it's not as luminous luminous as luminous or as energetic as a nova. All right, uh, the next question is from Mike. Is it possible for a rogue star to travel in the opposite direction of the galaxy? Absolutely. So stars are formed mostly in binary binary or multiple systems. And there's there are beautiful simulations now of how stars form. Um, really these simulations that have only been possible in the last decade with supercomputers or high-powered desktop computers. And these simulations just show how chaotic the early stages of star formation are. So stars tend to form in a cluster, and that cluster of stars disperses over time. Um, the sun, in fact, probably formed in a denser stellar region, and, and the remnants of that and the other stars that were companions of the sun have dispersed over the intervening four and a half billion years. But when you look at these simulations, what happens quite often, or especially early on when the star cluster is very young and quite tight in a gravitational sense, stars close together and moving fast, is that uh, young stars are essentially flung from the system. They're sl like a slingshot effect. They're ejected at very high speeds and, and liberated from the gravity of the young cluster. And that speed of liberation can easily be sufficient and in a direction to make them counter-rotate or sort of send them going around the galaxy in the opposite way. Um, so absolutely that happens. It's a fairly rare event. So these rogue stars, as we'll call them, are essentially rare, but there's definitely a mechanism where we know how that happens. Of course, they can also be ejected up and out of the galaxy. So we see stars in the Milky Way the X and Y coordinates in the Milky Way coordinate system are the plane of the galaxy, and the Z direction is in and out of the disk of the Milky Way. And the same ejection mechanism gives stars high, what are called Z motions. And so some of these rogue stars are just bombing their way out of the disk of the Milky Way, either up or down, for the same reason. All right, the next question um, is, what is the difference between the Doppler effect and the redshift? So the Doppler effect is a terrestrial phenomenon, it's sort of conventional physics that applies to any wave. Um, it's most familiar, of course, with sound waves. The, um, the compression of the waves as a source of waves approaches you leads to an increase in the frequency or pitch. And then as the source is moving away from you, a decrease in the frequency or pitch. You can think of the source of the waves sort of catching up with their own waves or running away from their own waves. And that's the sound familiar to everyone of a siren uh, raising in pitch as it approaches and lowering in pitch or frequency as it recedes. So that's the Doppler effect. And the same thing applies for light. And so when we look at exoplanets, which are, tend to be nearby in the galaxy for stars that are not really going anywhere because they're traveling around the galaxy with us, uh, the toing and froing of the planet around the star tugs the star and gives it a Doppler effect, and it's that Doppler effect that shows the planet is there. So these are relative motions in a reference frame, to use a physics term, that is defined either by the laboratory, if it's a terrestrial physics experiment, or the solar system, if it's a Doppler shift within uh, the solar system from a spacecraft, say, or within our nearby region of the galaxy if we're looking at Doppler shifts to measure exoplanets. The redshift is something different. The redshift is a, uh, a shift in the frequency or the wavelength of radiation caused by the expansion of space-time itself. So if the universe is expanding and you actually do the math and work out what happens to a photon in an expanding space-time framework, then the wavelength of the radiation is expanding too. 
and that means the photon is getting redder as it travels through expanding space-time. And that is the redshift. That means that when we look far away in the universe through expanding space-time, um, that photon reddens as it travels through space-time, and by the time it reaches us, it's red, redder than when it left. And that's the redshift we see for distant galaxies. And the further away those galaxies are, the redder the photons are. It's a linear effect because the expansion is linear, and that's the Hubble shift. That's a Hubble diagram, the Hubble relation that Hubble first observed in the late 1920s. Um, the next question is, uh, years ago I saw in the news that Mars was moving from west to east, then suddenly changed its direction and moved from east to west for a duration then back again. Uh, is that true? And can you explain what was going on? Sure. That's the retrograde motion of Mars that happens every couple of years. Um, so the Earth is uh, moving faster than Mars on an interior orbit, going around the Sun, as, as alluded to by Kepler's laws that we were talking about a while ago. Um, and what that means uh, is that if you look out towards the backdrop of stars from the position of the Earth, uh, as the Earth approaches Mars, as the Earth sort of overtakes Mars on the inside, so to speak, you think of it as a racetrack going around a circular racetrack like a speedway, um, then Mars will for a while, as the Earth overtakes on the inside, appear to move backwards against the fixed backdrop of stars. Then when the Earth pulls away, the Mars resumes its forward motion in the same direction as the Earth, as seen from the Earth. So this is a phenomenon that occurs uh, every time the Earth passes Mars in its orbit, which is every couple of years. And the retrograde phase of this lasts six, about six weeks. And so as seen on the plane of the sky, Mars will have its normal east to west motion through the plane of the fixed stars, through the pattern of the fixed stars. But then for this short period of time, every couple of years, we'll suddenly turn around, slowly backtrack from night to night, then stop and turn around again and continue its forward motion. This was it's an interesting phenomenon because you don't need a telescope, of course, to see it. You just need to be aware of when the right time to observe it is. Um, and it's a thing I've done with classes where I get students to do it over a semester. If it's the right, you know, if you get lucky with your semester, you can do it as a class project where everyone gets to do it themselves. It, of course, was critical information for cementing the Copernican idea because in the uh, geocentric cosmology, where the Earth is the center and all the planets go around the Earth, then obviously Mars is always going around the Earth the same way and should never back up in its apparent motion relative to the stars. So the geocentric cosmology has no explanation at all for why Mars should suddenly start backing up for a while and then continue its forward motion. And therefore, uh, the heliocentric model was critically affirmed, was its critical observational test was to be able to explain the retrograde motion, which had been seen since antiquity, obviously, for thousands of years, but nobody ever really understood it. All right, the next question is from Paul, who is again on with us live. Uh, with the well-known redshift of our accelerating universe, at what distance would the new James Webb Space Telescope be able to see this light before it's no longer visible because its expansion and speed exceeds or meets the speed of light. Basically, what will the James Webb be able to see and how far and right. why? What are the limits? So the James Webb is, um, I mean, it's an interesting situation because the universe has not been accelerating for the whole. So the James Webb, just to put the most important part first, the James Webb with its huge collecting area and its ability to work in the infrared, which given the redshift of very distant objects means that it's looking where the light actually is seen after being redshifted by traveling through space. The James Webb should be able to see further in space than the Hubble Space Telescope. Its goal is to see first light back to about five or maybe 3% of the age of the universe ago. So that's 3% of 13.8 billion years when we think the first stars and galaxies formed. That's the goal of the James Webb. That redshift is a redshift of about 10, which means the light from the time it's emitted has been stretched by a factor of 1 plus z, or about 10 or 11. That's the James Webb goal. As far as the acceleration, though, it's an interesting situation. It's not the case that the James Webb is going to be limited in what it can see by the accelerating universe. 
for this reason. The acceleration of the universe has only been going on for the last five billion years or so because uh, the, remember that the dynamics of the expanding universe is driven by two things. It's driven by dark energy, which is causing the acceleration, and dark matter, which on its own would cause a deceleration, a slowing down of the expansion rate. As the universe expands, the dark energy, because it appears to be a function of the vacuum and so constant, has had the same strength and is causing the same amount of acceleration in any region of space. But the dark matter, because it thins out as the universe gets less dense, has had a decreasing effect of causing deceleration. So what that means is in the last five billion years, dark energy is dominant and the universe is accelerating. But prior to that, dark matter was dominant and the universe was decelerating. So as the James Webb looks back in time, it will indeed be looking through back through five billion years of accelerating expansion, but then it will reach the phase where it's looking through decelerated expansion. And that means there's nothing removed from its view. It's just going to keep looking further and further back, as the Hubble Space Telescope has done, until it runs out of steam at the first light of the universe, that time, we think, a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. All right, Joan, who is on with us live, says, you already answered a question regarding the article about the universe having no beginning or ending. But the, but the explanation was a little difficult for those of us who like the background. Could you touch on this issue again in simpler terms? Of the universe? Having no beginning or ending. OK. Um, well, the beginning is there in the Big Bang model. So in the conventional cosmology, the universe does have a beginning. People, of course, have worked hard on the theory and tried to understand the cause of the Big Bang or precursor states or parallel universes and multiverse. But just to be very clear, it's important to be clear what is confirmed, what is affirmed, and what isn't by the scientific method. There's no evidence for that. So in simple terms, cosmology does talk about a beginning to the universe, and it's the Big Bang. And we cannot understand the physical state of the Big Bang, and we certainly can't understand with current theory any precursor state or any precursor situation. That doesn't stop, stop people speculating, but if we're being you know, sensible conservative scientists, conservative with a little c, then we don't really talk about that because there's no evidence. Um, the end of the universe we can talk about, and we can speculate as to what it will be like. Um, the end of the universe is really governed by dark matter and dark energy, which are causing the expansion to change over time. Because dark energy is now dominant and will get more dominant as time goes forward, the best guess unless there's something we really don't know about dark energy, like it decays over time. That's an important question that we would try and answer. But at the moment, if dark energy is invariant with time and space, then the universe will accelerate in its expansion forever. And so the fate or end of the universe is of dissipation, is of enormous vacuums of galaxies incredibly far apart from each other, and eventually galaxies so far apart from each other that their light cannot reach each other because they're all moving away from each other faster than light speed. So that's a very strange endpoint of the universe where each galaxy ends up becoming an island in accelerating space-time expansion, isolated from all other galaxies. Meanwhile, stars will die in these galaxies. The replenishment of new stars will cease as more material is locked up into stellar remnants like white, hole, white dwarfs, black holes, and neutron stars. So the galaxies will all go dark. And that's really with conventional cosmology, that's a fairly firm prediction as to what the end of the universe will look like. Okay, the next question is from email. Um, the question is, what's the current theory on the formation of the solar system? Many exoplanets have been found to be hot Jupiters in close orbits to their parent star. Surely this contradicts the theory that the gas giant planets form in the outer solar system where it is cold. Right, it's a good point. The uh, there's still an open question as to whether our solar system is typical. You know, when you only have one solar system to explain or to measure in great detail, you have to keep a slight open mind to the possibility that it was a fluke, that something about your solar system was just unlikely or unlucky or lucky or fluke, that it wasn't totally typical, because until you find more examples, you don't know. So we, we operated under the premise that our solar system was typical of how planets formed. 
until exoplanets were discovered. And as the questioner points out, uh, early in the history of exoplanets, the first discoveries were all were hot Jupiters. So well, let's flash forward 20 years of exoplanet research, and now we can put hot Jupiters into context. And so they do not just turn on its head the paradigm of the solar system formation, because we've now started to find exoplanet systems that are looking pretty much like our solar system, not completely, but largely. Uh, and hot Jupiters have now gone into context too. So hot Jupiters are not the dominant giant planet out there in the universe. Uh, there's small-ish fraction, it just depends on the survey you look at. They're between five and 10, maybe 15% of all large exoplanets are hot Jupiters. So they're definitely a minority. And we are starting to find Jupiters in normal Jupiter-like situations like our Jupiter. So people have, have been able to back off the fear, the concern that our solar system is just a freak and an oddball and not typical of what's out there in space. But what the existence of hot Jupiters has shown us, and it showed us this early on in 1995-96 when they were first discovered, is that giant planets can move around and planets can move around early in the history of any solar system. Uh, because we know that there's no, there's never, there's never enough material, and there's no mechanism by plausible physics to form a Jupiter or anything close to a Jupiter, way within the orbit of Mercury, for a sun-like star. You simply can't form the planets there. Uh, so either we don't understand anything at all about planet formation, or the planets form further out and migrate inwards, and. The theorists have come up with mechanisms whereby planets do migrate inwards. And this actually could have happened in our solar system too, very early on. It's possible there were more uh, giant planets than the ones we ended up with. And these, some of these uh, migrated inwards and were just swallowed by the sun. Remember that Jupiter is, you know, a, a thousand times less massive than the sun. So the sun swallowing a couple of early Jupiters doesn't really change its mass very much at all. It's just like being in a movie theater, you know, popping some kernels of popcorn. It's not really a big deal. Um, and that could have happened in our solar system. We don't know, but it's plausible that it happens quite commonly. So planets migrate. Not all the planets that migrate park in orbits and therefore become hot Jupiters. They have to be gravitationally locked and stabilized for them to be hot Jupiters that we can detect it's likely that most of the planets that migrate indeed fall into their star, disappear with no trace, and we're you know, never aware that they even existed billions of years later. So the whole thing has become fairly interesting. And just to return to the question that starts all this, how typical is our solar system? We simply don't yet know. It looks to be not as weird and atypical as we might have feared 20 years ago, but it also has some features, uh, and that, that could include the positions of the giant planets, definitely includes a low eccentricity, the very regular orbits of our planets, which are not seen in most exoplanet systems. It has some features that look to be a little unusual. So I'd say our solar system is mildly unusual. Uh, the next question is from Gerald, who is on live. In the proton-proton chain fusion process, are positrons created at each stage of the fusion process? Um, or is the production produced only at certain stages? No, they're produced at every stage because remember in any fusion uh, reaction, uh, there's a conservation of charge. And so, uh, you know, you're either to, to conserve the charge, you actually have to have uh, the charge of the, the net charge of the particles at the beginning of the interaction and at the end of the interaction be the same. And, and that's the reason why you, you need positron emission out of these. You also need neutrinos to come off these interactions. And so there are neutrinos produced at every stage. The positrons, of course, last almost no time because they're going to almost immediately annihilate with free electrons and produce gamma rays. So it just becomes part of the radiation that comes from the fusion reaction. All right, the next question is, uh, what does the size of a star depend on? It depends on uh, a model. So we have, we have uh, stellar theory, the stellar theory that was developed in the 1930s. It's essentially by Arthur Eddington, English theorist, working at the University of Cambridge, uh, provides the, the equations of stellar structure um, 
for gas that settles into a self-gravitating state where the, and is sustained at a fixed size by a fusion reaction. So basically, uh, there's a thermostatic effect whereby the star, the envelope of the star, adjusts to balance gravity at every point within the star uh, against the pressure from radiation from an interior region. And that's the hydrostatic equilibrium, as we say, that causes each star to be a static object while it's continuing with the same energy source. And uh, Eddington was just the first to work out the equations for this structure so that you could calculate essentially the pressure and the density and the temperature at every point within a stable star. So we've known this for almost a century now. It's just it's the kind of thing we teach our juniors in our astronomy major. It's a, it's a very basic stellar astronomy. All right, the next question is, um, oh, sorry, from Johanna. Uh, is time travel possible? And if so, how would that work? Well, we had a question earlier about the twin paradox. That's a, that's a sort of form of time travel, if you like, because if you could do that experiment, you would have a situation where uh, traveling at relativistic speeds and then returning to your destination you would have aged less than the people you left behind. So it seems like a kind of time travel. Uh, literal travel through time in other than the way, you know, the natural metabolic way that time passes is not possible as far as we know. Um, it's not completely ruled out in terms of laws of physics, but there's no physical theory to explain how you would actually do it. People have looked for, for instance, tachyons which are hypothetical particles, they're essentially mirror particles, if you like, particles that travel uh, faster than light and also travel back in time. Because as you, as you know, every particle has an antiparticle, has a mirror particle that has an opposite set of quantum properties. So in an extension of that idea, you can have uh, tachyons traveling backwards in time. It's a very nice idea. Antimatter obviously was confirmed by um, in 1940s, I think, so 60, 70 years ago. Tachyons have never been detected, and so we haven't found a particle that travels backwards in time. Um, and if we haven't found a particle that can do it, a subatomic particle, then it's very unlikely that a larger object like a person can do it. So at the moment, given the laws of physics, we think that time travel is impossible. The only asterisk on that or caveat on that involves what happens inside a black hole. Um, and that's controversial because the black hole theory is not complete. But in principle, and this is, uh, you know, if you want to read a book on this, I, Kip Thorne has a popular book on black holes, and he's one of the best gravity theorists in the world. He's been at the top of the game for decades. So this is a legitimate book by an a expert practitioner of relativity who wrote a nice popular book about it curved space-time, black holes, white holes, all those ideas. In the theory of black holes, if the black hole is spinning, then the uh, singularity turns into a torus. So you actually, you, you still have an infinity, but it's stretched into a two-dimensional shape rather than a one-dimensional point. And in principle, in a rotating black hole, uh, there's a toroidal region, which is called a time-like curve in general relativity, where if you could position yourself on that timeline curve and travel backwards and forwards around it, you would be traveling backwards and forwards in time. Um, that is a bizarre concept. Of course, you if you were inside a black hole, you'd be crushed out of existence just to get there. So this could only even be possible in principle in a very large and massive black hole where the differential gravity is not so much that it would crush you on the way in. Um, so that's the only asterisk, the only little escape hatch, is that inside a black hole, a spinning black hole, time travel is potentially possible. Okay, next question. Um, the farther we observe in the universe, and you touched on this a little bit, um, the farther we observe in the universe, the farther back in time we observe, does that mean that the whole history of the universe will always be available for us if we look far enough? Or is the li there a limit to how far back in time we can look? Yes, yes, good question, and, and yes, the simple answer is yes. As we look back, as we look out in space, we are looking back in time, and so we're just replaying with our data the history of the universe up to this point. And, and it's a pretty reliable procedure. It's what cosmology is based on. 
And with the Hubble Space Telescope, we played that history back to within the first half billion years. So the Big Bang is 13.8 billion years ago, and uh, telescopic observations, ground-based or Hubble, have got us, you know, through 90, almost 95 percent of the age of the universe. You can go back even further, much further, actually, with the microwave radiation from the Big Bang. When we see that microwave map, the famous image that I'm sure you've seen with the speckles, colored black, colored red and blue, depending on whether they're slightly hotter or slightly cooler than 2.7 Kelvin, that's radiation from about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, 380,000, actually. That's very close to the beginning. And that is a direct piece of evidence from the universe when it was that young. So at that point, we've replayed the history 99.99 something percent of the age of the universe. This is remarkable. And so that's, and that's very reliably measured, observed and in gory detail, actually. Before that, it starts to get sketchy. Now you're looking at particle physics, you're looking at kind of difficult to confirm phenomena in cosmology. But yes, we've replayed the history of the universe back through 99.99% of its history. Next question is, I was, and then this is actually going to be the last question because uh, we need to end just a little bit early today. Uh, I was, uh, this is from Douglas. I was fascinated by the description of the Antikytherium mechanism, an analog computer more than 2,000 years old. Do you think this was the exceptional work of one brilliant craftsman or group project? Why was it lost to antiquity? Yeah, it's a it's a fun um, it's a fun discovery. It was um, to just to short briefly summarize it. It was from one of the lectures in the history part of the course. Um, was a complete surprise found in a sunken wreck. It's actually found uh, the wreck was found uh, over a hundred years ago. Uh, the the artifact dates back almost two thousand years, and it was corroded, pitted, crushed in mud. You know, messed up. And it was just very advanced diagnostic techniques and MRI, electron microscopy and imaging that allowed people to see through the layers and then very painfully reconstruct what it was. And essentially, it's an analog computer that was able to calculate uh, not just calendar time, not just eclipses on things like the Saros cycle and even longer eclipse cycles, but it was actually calculating non-uniform motion of the planets, including a couple of the outer planets. That is information that we didn't think was available to observational astronomy until the Renaissance. So this is pretty striking, an incredible artifact. Its uniqueness is very hard to tell. No one's ever found anything like it. The best guess from historians is that it was based on a design, but not actually built by Archimedes. Archimedes clearly had the technical wherewithal and the engineering prowess, genius in fact, to design such a thing. So it's a pretty good guess that it was an Archimedes object. But that's not to say that it couldn't have been someone that just simply we don't know about. Um, it was being carried on a ship almost certainly as an object to trade and as an object when the Greeks traveled across the uh, Mediterranean to really impress, knock the socks off people who, found, who, who were showing it because it was such an incredible engineering achievement. Uh, so it was probably a showpiece, but it probably wasn't unique. It's very hard to find something like this and, and just suddenly lump, jump to the conclusion that it's the only one ever. There probably were a limited number of these. They were used for trade, they were used to impress people, and they were used for practical purposes, of course, to map the sky and measure time. Um, and this has rewritten the book on engineering. Essentially, engineering textbooks, the history of engineering, uh, textbooks were had to be rewritten when this object was found and understood because no one thought engineers could do this kind of thing it's back into antiquity. And remember the the techniques, you know, the lathes, the machine shop you might have if you were an engineer in 200 AD or 100 AD is pretty basic, pretty primitive. And these were brass gears. They were off-centric gears with teeth and cogs and 47 different moving parts, as I recall pretty extraordinary piece of engineering and, and fabrication as well. So it is a remarkable object and it is still unique. And that's all we have time for today. So I wish everyone happy holidays and we'll be back with you soon in the new year.